New York and baseball is like the perfect marriage. It's like sugar and spice, meat and potatoes, salt and pepper. But New York has never been a one-team town. Yes, the New York Yankees have ruled the sport since the existence with their 27 titles with Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig, Joe DiMaggio, Mickey Mantle, Yogi Berra, and Derek Jeter. But New York has always had room for both American and National League fans. And before the New York Mets came into existence, New York had three teams. The New York Yankees, the New York Giants, and the Brooklyn Dodgers. The Dodgers and Giants had some of the greatest players to ever play the game. The Giants had all-time greats such as Christy Mathewson, Mel Ott, and of course Willie Mays, who is regarded by many baseball historians as the greatest all-around player to ever play the game. The Dodgers had Pee Wee Reese, who was the most loved Brooklyn Dodger in the team's history. He was the captain from 49 to 57. Gil Hodges, who would later go on to manage the Mets, but we'll get into that in just a minute. Jackie Robinson, who was infamous for breaking the color barrier and being one of the greatest second basemen of all time. His number is still retired in every stadium throughout baseball. And of course, Duke Snyder, who was part of the trio at that time of three of the greatest center fielders in the history of the sport to be playing at the same time in the greatest city in the world. The Dodgers and Giants were bitter National League rivals, and some of the most passionate fans in the history of the sport came from these two franchises. From 1947 to 1956, the Dodgers and Giants combined to represent the National League in 8 out of the 10 World Series over that span, each winning a World Series apiece. And who could forget perhaps the most famous moment in the history of baseball in 1951 when the New York Giants won the pennant in a moment that was coined the shot heard round the world. Back to throw. In 1957, the Dodgers were in the midst of an impressive run. They had won five pennants and one world championship in an eight-year span. The team was extremely profitable. Ebbets Field was sold out to capacity on most nights, all 32,000 seats. But they were still sharing the same city with the rival New York Giants and the hated New York Yankees, who had beaten them in the World Series six times in the previous seven tries. However, the owner, Walter O'Malley, still wanted to move his team out west, he had an agreement with the city of Los Angeles for them to move to sunny California. Los Angeles had told them that they would build them a stadium, something Brooklyn would not do. As much success as the New York Giants had had leading up until 1957, in spite of winning a championship in both 51 and 54, the team could not draw nearly as many fans as their rivals, the Brooklyn Dodgers. So the owner, Horace Stoneman, thought by relocating the team to San Francisco, it would revitalize the franchise. So on May 28, 1957, National League owners voted unanimously to allow the New York Giants and Brooklyn Dodgers to move to San Francisco and Los Angeles, leaving the National League fans of New York heartbroken and without a team for the 1958 season. Then, four years later, the New York Mets were born. Meet the Mets, meet the Mets, step right up and greet the Mets, bring your kiddies, bring your wife, guaranteed to have the time of your life, because the Mets are really sucking the ball, knocking those home runs over the wall, east side, west side, everybody's coming down to meet the M-E-T-S Mets. New York so the New York Mets had been born, the orange and the blue, and of course they had gotten those colors from the two teams that have just moved out to sunny California. The blue was taken from the Dodgers and the orange from the New York Giants. And they had begun to play their games at the Polo Grounds in 1962 as they shared the stadium with the Jets. Now, the stadium was run down. It had been built in 1880, for God's sakes. It was 82 years old at the time that they had started playing there. The New York Mets took the field and made their debut for the first time on April 11, 
1962 against the St. Louis Cardinals in front of a sold-out audience at the Polo Grounds. The stadium was packed, and they were so pumped. New York was so pumped to have their National League team back. The fans couldn't wait. Now, the team was not much to look at. It was much like the stadium. They had such iconic names as Choo Choo Coleman, the catcher, Marvelous Marv Thornberry. But the team was going nowhere fast. And the first season was a complete embarrassment. In their inaugural year, the team set records. Not the type of record you should be proud of. They went 40 and 120. And since then, and before then, no team has lost that many games. That is right. That team set the record and still holds it for the most losses ever in a single season with 120. The Mets would continue to struggle at the Polo Grounds in 1963 before in 1964 a new stadium was built for $28 million dollars. Shea Stadium, a stadium that would bring hope and promise and memories, both good and bad, years to come for New York Mets fans. It opened in April 17th against the Pittsburgh Pirates. The Pirates beat the Mets 4-3 in front of a sold-out stadium of over 50,000 fans. As shiny and nice as the new stadium was, unfortunately for the Mets fans, the product was still the same. The Mets would finish with 53 wins their first year at Shea, and for the third straight season, they would finish dead last. It was not until the 1966 season, their fifth year in Major League Baseball, that the team would eclipse 60 victories, and they'd finish second to last. But in 1967 is where the team really turned a corner. There was a bright light, someone who brought hope to the New York Mets fans, the franchise, Tom Seaver. Seaver won Rookie of the Year in 1967 and went on to win three Cy Youngs as a Met and is the greatest player in the franchise's history. But it was almost all for naught. He was originally signed by the Atlanta Braves in February of 1966 out of the University of Southern Cal. But his contract was voided by the commissioner on the basis that the USC season had already started. In order to resolve this issue, the Mets, the Phillies, and Indians were all placed in a hat since they were the only teams willing to match the Braves' offer. And the Mets were fortunate enough to win the drawing. In addition to Seaver, two other young players came about in 1967, catcher Jerry Grote and shortstop Bud Harrelson. This trio of youth formed a new, determined, hungry clubhouse, a team that would not accept losing, and a team that brought about hope and change for the future. And in 1968, while the team still struggled, they finished ninth yet again, They had finished with over 70 wins. Improvement was evident. There was hope. Cleon Jones had developed. Exciting center fielder Tommy Agee had been acquired via trade. They had a new young and exciting manager named Gil Hodges. And the team was ready to pounce the following season. 1969 was one of the most incredible years in baseball history. Not just for the Mets, but for any franchise. It was coined the Miracle Mets. The Amazing Mets. The Mets, for their first seven years in existence, had been at baseball's doormat. No one saw this coming. The Mets began the 1969 season in a mediocre fashion, much like their previous two years. On opening day, they lost to an expansion team, 11-10, the Montreal Expos, and through the end of May, they sported an under 500 record. They were 21-23. and By mid-August, the Chicago Cubs seemed destined to be headed to the playoffs and to be capturing their first National League East Division crown. The Mets sat in third place, 10 games behind the Cubs, with less than a month and a half to play. But then something amazing happened. No, wait, no, it was a miracle. The Miracle Mets. As I said, they were 10 games out, with about 45 games to play in the baseball season in mid-August. And then all of a sudden, the tide started to turn. The Mets were winning every game they played. The Cubs started losing ball games, and by the time September 9th came around, The Mets had a two-game series set with the Chicago Cubs, and they had shaved off eight and a half games. They were only a game and a half out with about a half a month to play. And I'm not very superstitious, but I'll take luck where I can get it. And a lot of people point back to that September 9th night when the Cubs were taking on the Mets, where the Black Cats strolled across their dugout. And ever since then, the Cubs shrank and the Mets rose up. After that night, the Mets outgained the Cubs by nine and a half games in the standing, and they were able to finish 162 and finished in first place by eight games. An amazing turnaround. An 18-game turnaround. They were 10 games out. With a month and a half to play, they finished eight games up. 
That's nearly impossible. And then it was on to the playoffs. The Mets took on the Braves in the first round, and they swept them, and they went straight to the World Series to take on the overwhelming favorites, the Baltimore Orioles, who that year won 109 games. The Mets came in as heavy underdogs. The Orioles took Game 1, and Mets fans were nervous as hell. The Mets then proceeded to win Game 2, 3, 4. They had a 3-1 series lead going into Game 5, and they trailed 3-0 late in the game. Before Cleon Jones looked as if he was hit by a pitch, the ball bounced into the dugout. The umpire said it never hit him. They did not award him first base before the Mets manager went out there, and this is known as the shoe polish play. He has been thoroughly in command. Leon skipping to get out of the way, and it's ball one. He starts down to first base, and DeMuro calls him back. Hodges, uh, we might have a shoe polish play here. Remember the Nippy Jones shoe polish play in the 1957 World Series at Milwaukee? Hodges showing it to Lou DeMuro, who awards first base. Another shoe polish play. He went out and he showed the umpire the shoe polish on the ball, and the umpire awarded him first base, and then that brought up Don Clendenin, who hit a missile over the wall to cut it to 3-2. to two. Clendenin went on to win the World Series MVP, and the Mets went on to win the 1969 World Series as they took Game 5, 5-3. Five to three. And the Miracle Mets had fulfilled a miracle. Nothing anyone would have ever expected. They went from the basement to the penthouse in one year. A team that people laughed at their first 7-8 years in existence. The Mets were kings of the baseball world. Despite the high hopes following the 69 championship season, the Mets could not reach the playoffs again until 1973. And that year, the Mets actually got off to a great start. In April, they had a 600 winning percentage until they completely fell apart. By the end of August, they were 10 games under 500 at 61 and 71 and nowhere near the playoffs. That is when, at the time, manager Yogi Berra had a meeting with the players and the infamous quote, from Tug McGraw, the Mets closer at the time, yes, father of Tim McGraw, the famous country singer, got the Mets together and said, you gotta believe. Well, the team took those words to heart, and they won 21 out of their last 29 games, sneaking into the playoffs with a final record of 82-79, and 79, before taking on the big red machine in the NLCS, one of the most infamous teams in Major League history, led by Pete Rose and everyone else, and they were able to take them down before losing to the Oakland A's in the World Series. After that 1973 miraculous season, the magic was gone. The Mets would not make the playoffs for quite some time. And sadly, in 1975, the original owner, Joan Payson, had passed away. She was a huge fan of the New York Mets, and she took great pride in owning the club, and she was a great owner. She passed it down to her husband, Charles, who had very little interest in the day-to-day -day operation, so he passed it down to his three daughters, who then eventually sold the team in 1980 to the Doubleday Publishing Company. Nelson Doubleday bought the club in January of 1980 for just over $21 million and was named chairman of the board, while minority shareholder Fred Wilpon took role of club president. Wilpon, of course, is the owner today. Um, they later became partners. In February, Wilpon hired longtime Baltimore Orioles executive Frank Cashin. Cashin was responsible for the resurgence of the Orioles in the 60s and 70s, and he brought that to the Mets. His positive impact was not felt right away in 1980. It took time. He drafted some of the franchise's cornerstones that turned this franchise around. He selected Darryl Strawberry with the first overall selection in the 1980 draft. Two years later, he took Dwight Gooden in the 1982 draft with the fifth overall selection. Both of them came up through the minor league system and won back-to-back -back Rookie of the Year awards. Strawberry in 83, Gooden in 84, and Hope was on the horizon. Cashin's midseason 1983 trade for former MVP Keith Hernandez, the first baseman from the St. Louis Cardinals, who is one of the best defensive first basemen to ever play the game was a huge building block for this team. They hired da uh, manager Davey Johnson in 1984, who was promoted from the AAA Tidewater Tides, and this team was starting to get on the right track. In 85, the Mets made the move that put this team well within contention. They went out and they acquired the kid, Gary Carter, who became one of the leaders of this team and eventually made the Hall of Fame. 
They won 98 games in 85 and just missed the playoffs as they lost the division narrowly to the St. Louis Cardinals, which set up the 1986 season, which is by far the best New York Mets team in the history of the franchise and one of the best teams ever in the history of baseball. Before the 86 season had started, Wilpon and Doubleday had become full partners. They were now equal owners. Going into the year, everybody knew that this team was special. They finished the season very strong, and they were coming in very hungry with a, by far, the most talented team in baseball. They had a ton of young talent, a ton of talented veterans. It was a perfect makeup for a team, and the team was ready to go, and they certainly did not disappoint. They started out the year winning 20 of their first 24, and there was no race throughout the entire year. They ran away and hid in the division. There was no excitement in the regular season. By the All-Star break, people knew the Mets were going to win the division. They ended up going 108-54, and 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 they slept walk their way through the regular season. However, the 86 players were anything but that. The Mets made you sweat it out in typical Met fashion. They started out in the NLCS against the Astros. The Astros came into the league the same year the Mets did, in 1962, and the Astros had two stud pitchers at the top of their rotation. Ironically, both were former Mets, Mike Scott and Nolan Ryan who the Mets let go early on in his career. Scott that year had won the Cy Young, and he was unbelievable. They pushed the Mets nearly to the brink. The Mets were up 3-2 in the series in Game 6, when they made a monumental comeback late in the game to send it to extra innings, where they won in 16 innings to send themselves to the 1986 World Series against the Boston Red Sox. The 1986 World Series between the New York Mets and Boston Red Sox is as good as it gets. And it involves one of the most iconic moments, not just in the history of baseball, but in the history of all the sports. The World Series was a back and forth battle. And the Mets fell down three games to two as they were about to squander the greatest season in the history of the franchise. They needed to come up with a win in both games six and seven at Shea Stadium. With their backs against the wall, Game 6 was back and forth at the stadium. Tie game, they went to extra innings, and the Red Sox scored two runs in the top of the 10th. With the Mets trailing by two in extra innings, three outs until their season was over. The first two batters made out, so they were down two runs with only one out to go with nobody on. And for this, I'm going to let Keith Hernandez take over. 6-86 6-86 and 86 World Series against Boston. Probably the greatest comeback in World Series history. Here's Keith Hernandez. Fly to center, fouled out. Single to center, walked intentionally. One for three. Keith Hernandez, after making out in the bottom of the 10th in game six. And the Mets are down to their last out. Went back to the clubhouse, grabbed himself a beer put his feet up on the desk in the manager's office to watch the last out. And Roger Clemens hoping for that last out. Remember, we're one out from elimination. We're done. This stuff started transpiring. Consecutive base hits. Harry Carter at second, two out. And that's going to be hit into center field. Base hit. Here comes Carter to score. And the time run is at third in Kevin Mitchell. I've sat down here and we've got three straight hits. I'm not leaving this chair. It was just like an earthquake, but we were underneath. So I hope this old ballpark can withstand this. So the winning run is at second base. Three and two to Mookie Wilson. Little roller up along first. Behind the back. It's
And then after all that, of course, the Mets had to come back the next night and win Game 7. And in Game 7, they trailed by three runs. The Mets, of course, came back and won that game 8-5. to five, And Ray Knight took home the World Series MVP. And the Mets took home their second World Series crown. So there you have it. There's the Mets history from 1962 to 1986. If you like what you watched, please subscribe, drop a comment, give me a little thumbs up, and I hope you guys tune in for part two.